Thank you. So this is really about uh, two papers. So this is a, a paper we did uh, some time ago with uh, Florian Fasol. Uh, he was a, an intern working with me, and we just wanted to have a cool formalization project to formalize something in type theory and as an experiment with um, some extensions of, of POT. Uh, so homotopy type theory is, is, uh, has been introduced to you by Andy in the previous talk. Um, so I hope that gives you some flavor. And there's a connection between homotopy type theory and higher topos theory, a conjectured uh, connection between those, and I'll try to um, point a bit in that direction. Um, but I've cut down the, um, so, so what's possible is to make an interpretation of type theory, homotopy type theory in certain uh, higher toposes, especially simplicial sets, and also a number of uh, P-sheaf toposes where we actually know how everything works out, and there's a conjecture that this can be extended. Um, but most of what's going on is actually at the uh, at the one level. So I'll first pr um, present everything at the one topos level and then uh, give somewhat more details about the formalization. Um, and at the same time we were doing this, uh, so does the pointer work? Daniel Wang was writing his PhD thesis where he actually uh, implemented a um, probabilistic programming language mainly guarded towards machine learning. Um, and one of the things he did was to actually write an efficient compiler uh, for uh, probabilistic programming languages. And not only that, he also gave a very precise semantics in something called topological domains. So we started to discuss, and then it turned out that what we did from basically general, general abstract nonsense, that's what they came up with just by very concrete implementations. And I'm now very happy that we, um, we wrote a paper together um, explaining these connections. So that's a recent paper that's now on the archive. Um, so I just want to present um, those, those two connections to you. And, um, so I'll start by explaining the, uh, the, the one topos case. So it's an application of topos theory to probabilistic programming. And um, it's, it's also um, a research program on higher topos theory and homotopy type theory. In fact, I have a, a, a PhD position on this topic. So if you has, uh, have any strong candidates, please let me know. Um, so what Haskell pro did, this will be um, very standard for, for uh, probably half of the audience, but I just want to point it out for the other half. Um, so what Haskell programmers do following the work by Moji is, so in Haskell you use a Cartesian closed category to write all your functional programs, but then there are a number of awkward constructions that don't completely work. And what Moji has pointed out that this can be very neatly um, organized using a monad. <coughs> so, so for instance, if you want to have a notion of undefinedness, you, you use the plus one uh, monad, you add a bottom element to every type. You use the, uh, the Gleisley category like so. Um, you can do um, state, uh, functional programming with states, and then you, you have a type S for state, and you carry, carry it around from one state to the other. That should be uh, times. Um, you have non-determinism, non -determinism. so if you do this in a set theoretic semantics, you would take either the finite power set or the, the uh, ordinary power set, and this will give you non-deterministic non computations, and the Gleisley category will actually be uh, relations or finite relations, relations with finite uh, codomain. And uh, something very similar can be done with discrete probabilistic, so this, this is the, the simplest way of doing probabilistic computations <coughs> in a system like Haskell, in a functional programming language. You just say, well, the monad I take is uh, convex combinations of X and um, of your type X. So formal convex combinations, so you just have elements from X and you annotate them by uh, a formal convex combination. Um, and this, this can be induced if you want by, I mean if you write it down as a, uh, as a programming language, you then you just add to your programming language a construction for a biased coin flip. So a coin flip with a uh, probability P between uh, zero and one. Um, so these are the discrete probabilities, and then you can do uh, quite a lot with this, but there are a number of applications, especially machine learning, but also differential privacy, where there's a strong push towards having 
probabilities, say, over 0, 1, or over the real numbers. So we actually want to extend this semantics um, to, uh, to, a, to a semantics where you actually have continuous data types. Um, and so, so now to motivate such a program, what you do is you find a famous person who said that this was a good idea. Um, the famous person in, in this case is Gordon Plotkin, who of course has contributed a lot on this topic. Um, and he says we want to have a, um, a framework um, which should support continuous and discrete types, a rich variety of functions between them, random choice, that's something that I already indicated, so that gives you convex combinations. Um, a rich variety of distributions, conditioning, um, a rich type system, so some product function types, probability types, recursive definitions, and recursive de definitions of types. Um, I don't claim to have all of those, but most of those we can actually do, and I'll, I'll show you uh, how to do those. And actually, um, uh, the, the Augur language, the one that was developed by um, by General Wang, we actually have has most of them. So that's uh, I think that's a, a very nice, very nice language. So if you look at classical probability, then you would be looking classical probability would be modeled by classical measure theory, as you all know. So you would be looking at measures on sigma algebras of sets, and then a measure algebra, of course, is a um, collection of sets um, closed on a countable union and countable uh, intersection, and a uh, measure will just be a sigma additive map. Now, because we're in a topos theory setting, of course, we're going to do this more locally, um, or well, first, first categorically. So the obs first observation, and that's the uh, that's in a, a, a beautiful paper by uh, Giri, where she shows that um, the collection of measures on a set is actually a monad, a monadic construction. And this allows you to capture many constructions in probability theory. And this, can, and this is a monad on, a, you, you, you can play a bit with what kind of category you, you define this on. So you can say, well, I either take measurable spaces, or I take polished spaces, or I take uh, some, some other uh, subcategory of topological spaces. There's uh, work by uh, uh, Jones and Plotkin, the, the same pl Plotkin I uh, showed the slide of before, on extending this to domains, because this gives you a much nicer setting to develop the uh, um, semantics for programming languages. And so what you do in this domain theoretic setting is you don't look at measures uh, because now, so if you look at measurable spaces or topological spaces, then the underlying, arguably, the underlying, um, uh, they're, they're still, these are still concrete categories. So you actually have an underlying set. Um, that's no longer the case in domains. So domains are cert certain uh, post sets, uh, and you cannot just uh, do the, uh, the sigma algebras, but you actually want to. Uh, look only at what your measure does on open sets. And there's actually an equivalence. If you look at regular measures, well, to, to every measure, say, on a um, Borel set, on a Borel sigma algebra, you can just restrict it, obviously, on the open sets, and you get what is called a valuation. Um, now, given a valuation on, say, a compact, compact regular topology, compact Hausdorff topology, you can actually extend it to a measure. So there, in the uh, compact case, you actually have a one-to-one -one correspondence. So you don't lose anything. So, but what, what we'll be doing is uh, considering valuations. Um, so now the next thing we need to do is to um, do topology in a topos, but we want to do it in such a way that not um, that it's not a set with some extra structure, but we want to do it in such a way that actually every object in our topos has a topology on it. And I'll show you how to do this, uh, but first to give some, some motivation. So this is a program that's called um, synthetic uh, topology, going back to um, probably synthetic differential geometry first, and then the, uh, the observation by, or, or the work by uh, Dana Scott, that we could also do synthetic domain theory. So wouldn't it be nice if domains were actually sets well, this cannot be the case, but it can be the case if you work in a topos. Um, 
And this is the work by uh, Highland and Rosalini. They, they, show they showed that domains are actually sets, but sets in a specific topos. So this is a, a very nice way, and you, you have a domain-specific. I mean, if you're talking to computer scientists, you would say, well, we actually have a, we use this topos as a domain-specific language for domains. Um, this program has been extended to synthetic topology. Arguably, this goes back to Brouwer, but you can s there's a lot of work by Martin Escardo, Paul Taylor, Steve Vickers, who's sitting at the back, uh, Andre Brouwer. <laughs> oh, you were sitting at the back. Um, and, and you want to do this in such a way you have a category where every object actually has a topology, and often what you do is you take topological spaces and extend this into a, a bigger uh, um in a bigger category, and what you do is you characterize the topology by maps into a Sapinski space. So in topological spaces, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between maps to the Sapinski space and open sets, because you just look at the inverse image of the top point. Um, so that's what we have here. Um, but now the, uh, the nice thing about this is that we can use a lot of ideas from, uh, from programming languages, from uh, lambda calculus, to derive theorems in topology. And these people have uh, shown quite impressive results that a lot of these things can be captured very um, quite abstractly using just a very concise uh, calculus from programming languages to actually get, uh, get these results. So the idea is that you, you take a convenient category or a convenient type theory of topological spaces. And this is connected to the idea, and I'll, I'll say a bit more, uh, more about this, of these uh, virtual topological spaces that was mentioned before. Uh, so so one, one way of obtaining this is to um, take your topological space and then embed them into a topos so that you have a virtual extension. Um, another possibility is if you look at um, computability theory, you can look at uh, synthetic computability or synthetic computability where you actually have real number computations. And this again can be captured very nicely in such a way. And then instead of looking at the Sipinski space, you would take the um, semi-decidable uh, truth values. Uh, so those are um, truth values, elements of the subobject classifier, so sigma will be an element, will be a subset of the subobject classifier, such that uh, you can, in a countable way, uh, either decide whether something is true. Um, and what is important here is that we have the dominance action. So because sigma will be a subset of the um, the subobject classifier, it actually classifies a collection of monos. Now the dominance action says that uh, you actually have uh, you actually get a category of such monos, so, so such maps actually compose them. And this is uh, something that was isolated by Pino Rosolini in the uh, setting of synthetic domain theory. Um, now what we're going to do is build up um, computability, uh, synthetic topology, and but also we want to do. Uh, we want to also have real numbers in our topos, so we want to ha know a bit more about the topos. So there are a few more actions that we want to do if we actually want to develop all our, um, all our topology using um, this uh, Sapinski space. So what we do is we uh, need two more uh, actions, and this comes, this action comes from the work by uh, Lesnick, who wrote a, a PhD thesis showing that a lot of um, analysis mostly metric analysis, so uh, theory of real numbers, metric spaces, can actually be developed quite nicely in such a synthetic uh, setting. Um, and one observation is countable choice is often not needed. So one, uh, one axiom you want to do is to connect the intrinsic topology on the one-point compactification of the natural numbers. So the one-point com one compactification of the natural numbers will be given by all the increasing binary sequence. So you keep track of um, what number you're, I mean, the number at which you jump encodes the number, and of course, if you don't jump, if the sequence is always zero, you get the, uh, uh, the constant, uh, you, you, you get 
So the, the constant zero sequence is mapped to the infinity object. Now, if you're working in classical logic, of course, this comes with a discrete topology, this set. But now, if you're working in one of these toposes that I'll introduce in a minute for synthetic topology, uh, then you can actually have an action like this. So this says that the intrinsic topology, namely the one you get from uh, mapping into uh, our sigma, our Sapinski space, coincides with the metric topology. So the metric topology is the one uh, given by, uh, I mean, the, the, the obvious metric topology on, on sequences. Um, the, if you want, it's the topology that comes from looking at this as a subspace of Kendra space. That's, that's one way of seeing this. It's a natural topology. Um, another way of stating this axiom is saying that if we have a map from the one-point compactification to sigma, such that the f of infinity is one, then it's actually already one at one of the finite points. So that's one of the ways of stating this. Um, as I said, so this axiom contradicts classical logic, but it holds in a model of result. Um, so we're adding non-classical non -classical axioms to our topos. Um, there's a stronger principle, um, namely uh, that uh, Cantor space is actually metrizable and compact. And again, this holds in, uh, in our models. And this is something that holds very naturally in these big toposes because you have a <coughs> full, full and faithful embedding of the topological spaces into this topos. Um, so what we're going to do, I'll, I'll present some models in the uh, following slides, but what we'll be doing is we'll fix one of such topo, uh, we'll fix a top, uh, such a topics and, and we'll be uh, working in such a setting. Um, what we're doing here is mostly needed to actually uh, code up the real numbers in the correct way to have the, the real numbers with the correct topology with the correct topology encoded by, so to connect the topology of the real numbers with the topology you get from, from, from the synthetic topology. Um, so this is, so this hasn't been presented in the school, but of course this is the, the other class of models of, uh, uh, the, the other way of constructive toposes, constructing toposes. So these are the realizability topos, and they are built, so they're toposes in which everything is uh, computable. And so what you do is you start with a partial combinatorial algebra or a model of the untyped la lambda calculus. So there are two obvious models, two, two very well studied models. So this is uh, K1, the first cleany algebra, which just takes the ordinary Turing machines. So this is ordinary Turing computability. Um, the K2 or the cleany Vesely uh, PCA is the one where you look at Turing machines which have infinite input tapes and infinite output tapes and you're required um, to after having read a finite amount of input you need to uh, give someone some kind of output so you cannot wait forever. Um, so what you get in these uh, topos is, is you get a notion of sets but every set carries a structure of um, carries some kind of computability structure. And this, uh, so this beautiful work by first Highland and then by Andy Pitts showing that this can actually be made into a topos and there are, there are two different constructions to do this. So this is a well-studied well uh, um, well uh, part of, uh, of topos theory. Um, but it, one of the very interesting things is that it, um, that it gives you a, a very different class of models from the, uh, the growth in these topos. Um, what is nice is that there's actually a nice um, embedding of these realizability models into the sheet models, and that's one of the things that, that will be one way of connecting the, the two anticipation. So an, another way of getting to these axioms, uh, sorry, so what I should say is that the if we take the ordinary Turing machines, then we will not have a model of our synthetic topology, especially if we take the ordinary Turing machines, we will not have the fan theorem, so the um, unit interval will not be compact. But if we take the uh, Kleene Vesely uh, PCA, then actually the Turing machines will be, uh, sorry, the unit interval will be compact. And 
one of the ways of seeing this is that well, this PCA was actually precisely developed to models Brouwer's Fan theorem. So I mean, it's it's the way it was built to make this true. Um, but this can be nicely embedded into sheaf models, and the sheaf models have also been been constructed in such a way to actually justify uh, the Brouwerian axioms. So, well, this actually goes back to um, goes back to Grothendieck, I think. So we we look at the notion of a topolog topological site. So this is a, a category of topological spaces which is closed under open inclusions. So and then. Um, so what we want to do is we take a class of topological spaces, a category of topological spaces, and we want to make it into a topos. And, and this is the construction we've seen, seen before. So you basically want to do a sort of Yoneda embedding, but that doesn't quite work, so you still need to put a topology on the, um, on the category. So you say that uh, a family of uh, maps actually covers a space if they're jointly epimorphic. This is basically the only natural thing you can can do. And then a, a big topos uh, or grow topo is um, sheaves over such a site. And these are uh, quite well studied. And again, they're also quite, they're, they're one of the canonical models. If you look at the book by McLean and Mordike or the work by uh, Mike, uh, Mike Fuhrman, you will see that these were proposed precisely as um, models for Brauerian intuitionism. Um, and yeah, so one of the things that's going on here is a, something general you see in many places in, uh, in category theory. There's a trade-off between studying nice categories and studying categories of nice objects. So we started from a category of nice objects, a category of topological spaces, but now we go to category of topological spaces is not very well behaved. It doesn't have good closure properties. It doesn't have good uh, type formers, if you want, if you're, if you're thinking um, in a, as a computer scientist. Um, so what we do is we trade the nice structure on the objects for having a, a very nice uh, category. So we're, we actually have a topos here. So now, so we fix such a topos. So we can, can choose either this realizability topos or one of these, um, these big topos uh, on a topological site. And now we develop the theory of um, the theory of valuations inside this setting. So, uh, and, and there we need several notions of real numbers. So we have the ordinary, uh, in, in the topos you have uh, various notions of real numbers. Obviously you have the, the dedicate real numbers. Those are defined by such a cut where you actually have, uh, so I'll first define the lower real. So a lower real is um, a map, in this case, from the rationals to our, uh, our dominance, and then we want it to be lower closed. And a dedicate real is a lower real, uh, sorry, upper real is the same thing, but we have it, so it's an, an upper cut in the rational numbers, and a dedicate real is a pair of those so that they actually uh, touch. So, in the, uh, so this is just a standard definition of a, a dedicate real number. Um, so you, in, in a topos, you have the dedicate reals. Of course, you also have the Cauchy reals. We won't be using, uh, using those here uh, because they're not so important. What is important is the lower reals because we want to look at valuations. And then valuations will be um, maps from our open, uh, open sets to uh, the lower real numbers, the positive lower real numbers, such that you map the empty set to zero, you have the modularity axiom, you have the monot monotonicity, and you have the uh, Scott continuity. So if you have an increasing sequence, then the, uh, the values will also increase to the, uh, to the limit. Um, and then you can also look at positive integrals, and the integrals here can go actually to the dedicate reals, and that's a bit of a, uh, a miracle that that actually works. And an integral will just be a map. You take a continuous function, a positive continuous function, such that uh, the integral over the constant zero function will be zero. It's additive, it's monotone, and it, uh, it's a probability measure, probability integral. Um, what we showed before is that there's actually a homeomorphism between the locales of valuations and the locales of integrals. 
Um, but this only works in the case where A here is a uh, compact regular locale. Now, in this setting, we actually generalized from locales to we just take any set, and this set will carry a topology. So we need to have a slightly different construction. Uh, fortunately, this is available, and this is the work by uh, Steve Vickers, who observed that if you actually take the, um, the lower reals, the lower integrals here, so then you map the integrals, your integrals will not be functions that take actual uh, continuous functions to uh, actual numbers, but they will take lower semi-continuous functions to lower semi-continuous uh, real numbers. And what Steve Vickers showed is, is very nicely is that you can now uh, extend these constructions to all the locales. Um, what we do here is just purely formally drop the condition that we have a locale and just use any set in this uh, setting for synthetic topology and we change the locale by a, uh, a map like so, and then we do just basically the same construction, and it actually works. Yeah? Can you take the uh, map of the distribution? Uh, continuity, uh, continuity. Scott continuity. So, yeah. So now, and once we, we have all of this, once, we've, once we have constructed the valuations, then what we can do is uh, look at the uh, at the Giri monad. So you take all your spaces or your set in your uh, synthetic your your topos for synthetic topology, and then go to the space of its valuations, and then the uh, the unit operation for this monad. So I'm presenting here the um, the monad as a Clash uh, triple, the the way it's uh, the way Haskell programmers use it, which of course is equivalent to the uh, the standard monadic uh, presentation. So the unit operation is just the uh, direct measure, and the bind operation is integration, uh, like so. This is so the bind operation is this map like so. So it's it's actually very simple and it's very concrete to write uh, to write down. So now, um, what is the problem with the uh, so? Th there's a topic that I already pointed out. Uh, one of the things we want to do is um, extend standard uh, probabilistic programming so the Giri monad doesn't work, uh, doesn't give you a comput full computational lambda calculus because you don't have a Cartesian closed category. What has been done by the work in, uh, um, in domain theory uh, by Jones and Plotkin is that you can actually extend this uh, to a model where you both have the um, the full lambda calculus, so it's Cartesian closed, and you also have this. Uh, um, you also have this probabilistic programming, um, and here we can see that we can actually very nicely do this because our set, our the uh, the sets in our topos are obviously Cartesian closed, and we do this whole construction in our uh, in our sets, the um, setting for um, synthetic uh, topology and we actually obtain a higher order language, so we have function types. So this is very pleasant for uh, probabilistic programming. Now, moreover, the Kleist category will be C, um, will be omega um, CPO enriched. That means you can take um, limits of uh, a countable chain of uh, uh, elements in your CPO, and this is used to model recursion. So recursion is given by the least fixed point of such an uh, operator from CPO. And because and and why is this uh, CPO enriched? Because we use subprobability valuations. So and this is so we we enforce that the total mass of a valuation is less than one, but we don't require it to be precisely one. And this is a standard way of combining. So if you combine the monad I gave you before, the plus one monad, where things don't need to be defined, with the standard here monad, then you can actually get this one, you can get the sub-probability sub monad. So that's a, um, a nice way of doing this. So now we have a, a rich semantics for a programming language, and, and this uh, satisfies many of the requirements that, uh, that uh, Gordon Plotkin said. Uh, so all of this is uh, in the paper by, uh, with uh, Florian <coughs> Faisal, and, and most of this has already been uh, formalized also in type theory. Um, and I'll say more about the formalization later on, but let me 
connect to um, uh, the work by Dan Wang. So he actually implemented all of this to run very efficiently also on graphics cards and ha gave a very nice uh, semantics in topological domains. So topological domains, that's a refinement of domain theory where every domain not only carries, uh, so it, it doesn't carry the uh, Scott topology, but it cont uh, contains, so it carries a computational structure and from this you uh, compute the uh, um, an extra topological structure. Now the theorem that we proved is actually the interpretation of the monadic calculus in that I just showed you that we did from, I mean, entirely abstract nonsense, actually coincides with what he found coming from entirely the different way. So he just wanted to have a um, programming language that runs efficiently but has a good semantics. Um, so I'm quite, quite pleased by this result. In the end, if you have all the pieces, it's not too difficult to prove, but I'm, I'm happy that we arrived at, the, uh, at, the at actually precisely the same result. So this is the, um, the first part of the, uh, of the lecture. Now I want to say a bit more about the, the formalization and how this extends to uh, how we can actually uh, incorporate. So what we've done is we've not taken the uh, standard uh, set, uh, the standard topos of sets, but we've taken a different topos. So now how can we extend this to a higher topos? So a higher topos as studied by uh, Jacob Lurie and Charles West, for instance. Um, so, so why do we want to formalize all of this in homotopy type theory? Well, there, there are a number of, uh, number of reasons. One is we want to be uh, absolutely sure that all of this is correct because, I mean, one hope for these languages running, um, this will be driving machine learning, so this will decide whether you um, will be able to get a mortgage or this will decide whether your uh, car will go either left or right, stop at the right time. So, so a priori, these things are very, uh, very important. Um, so, so we want to, to have a formalized semantics. Um, but we also want to have a programming language with a very efficient uh, type system. And so we don't only want to have the um, constructions from, uh, from topos theory, where we have the local Cartesian closure, um, but also the, uh, the, the uh, quotients and so on. Um, but we also even have the higher structure, so we have universes and so on. We can have everything in one setting. Um, so so that's, that's another motivation uh, that we can actually do this. The uh, a third motivation is that we don't actually have a good uh, type theory for the extensional type theory of a topos. I mean, we, we have a type theory, but it doesn't have a good reduction semantic, so that's missing. And in the intentional type theory, the Martin Luff type theory that we uh, know very well, there one of the very strong points is that if you take a standard proof assistant like Coq or Agda, you have a program that you th you've written there, it can actually run very efficiently, especially uh, Coq is now, I mean, it's very efficient. It's, uh, I mean, getting close to, uh, to OCaml, for instance. So, and we would like, uh, like to have the same for the programs we write in topos theory. And the, the paradox now is that actually no one really knows how to do this for standard topos theory, but we do know how to, have how to do it for the cubicle type theory. So the cubicle type theory has a reduction semantics, and it's actually the best way we know to have uh, type theory where we have functional extensionality <coughs> and also quotient types. Um, so we will, at by going towards uh, higher toposes, or the conjectured higher toposes, going towards homotopy type theory, we actually get a programming languages, a programming language for one topos theory, which we don't know how to do for standard one topos theory. So that's another motivation. Um, so what we started out from, so I'll, I'll give you part of what we actually formalized and part some motivation of the connections with uh, higher topos theory programs. So there's a, um, uh, a library in the Cock proof assistant, which is the, um, so this is a library for discrete measure theory and it uses um, the monadic approach. So you look at uh, certain measures and this is um, part of the uh, CPS translation for uh, people that like, I mean, that are into programming. And then you take a submonad that actually is monotone, summable and linear. The problem is that Koch cannot prove that this submonad is actually a monad because you don't have functional extensionality. 
So the current Koch type theory doesn't allow you to prove even basic properties of deterministic uh, programming, uh, programming languages. And, and that's a general theme. So if you want to prove properties about Haskell programs, if you want to prove things about monads, then usually you want to use functional extensionality and you don't have that available. Um, so one example you write down is, for instance, the coin flip. And, uh, and in such a language, this is what a coin flip looks like. And the question now is, can we avoid the setoid hell? So the cock type theory, it lacks functional extensionality and it also lacks quotient types. If you want to state this in a um, uh, categorical setting, or, or the solution to this uh, by Martin Hoffman, Hoffman was to actually look at what is called setoids. So setoids are a degenerated version of uh, groupoids. Uh, so what you take is you take an object of your original type theory with an equivalence relation on it and then the idea is you mod out by this equivalence relation. This is very close to the exact completion of a category. It's not quite the same in some cases. But if you think about um, we take the exact completion of our type theory so that we actually add quotient constructions, that's good enough for this, uh, this talk. Um, so yeah, the Koch type theory it lacks the quotient types, and one way of solving this is also you get functional extensionality by modding out uh, two functions that are pointwise equal. So that's that's the equivalence relation. Now the univalent homotopy type theory that we've seen in the previous talk. So that's a type theory introduced by Kowalski, um, which gives a homotopical interpretation, an interpretation of type theory in simplicial sets, and there's a, a big program in proving lots of properties in abstract homotopy theory or abstract algebraic topology using the, uh, the language of uh, homotopy type theory. Um, and one, one way of seeing this is so the, uh, in so the univalent homotopy type theory can be seen as an internal type theory for setoids and setoids are the zeroth level if you want and then you go to the first level so then you have groupoids. The second level, you have two groupoids. You want to push this all the way to infinity to get infinity groupoids. And that's the model in simplicial sets. So the setoids are actually the, the first step. So it's very natural. So this is a very natural extension of what was already a trick that's already used by Koch programmers to go to this exact completion. And now we actually have go all the way to infinity. Um, what we're building up is a, a library that we developed uh, for Hot. Um, so, so how does it actually connect? So, so now, so we have our standard models for uh, homotopy type theory. That's the uh, simplicial model. And there are a few other models. Um, those have been developed by, uh, mostly by um, uh, uh, Szyzynski and Schulman. So they showed that there, there are many. So you can interpret homotopy type theory in every um, Grothendieck infinity topos. So this is a, a big result. What's missing is that the interpretation of the universe is, is not strict. So there's an isomorphism or equ equivalence floating around somewhere. That's not uh, usual in, in the standard type theory. And what especially Mike Schulman has done is there are um, quite a few, uh, there's a quite a big subclass of um, 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 preceived uh, infinity toposes where you actually can prove that you, uh, you have this strict universe. Um, of course, all of this uses a classical meta theory. Now, there's also an approach that's completely constructive. That's the approach using cubicle stacks. That's the work by Thierry Cocan. There's recent work on cubicle assembly that was mentioned in the previous talk. This builds on the uh, internal universe construction. And this also builds on the... Uh, uh, so, Omar, he, he completed the whole construction. But this is work that uh, had been going on uh, for quite a while, these cubicle assemblies, by a number of people, including uh, Steve Audi, Jonas Rai, and Peter Hofstra. Um, and I think one of the things they're trying to do is actually to get the empirical universes in this setting. Um, there's also a cubicle model in NUPL. So this gives you a cubicle realizability model. So that's another push to make reali realizability models for homotopy type theory. And then also these internal models allow you to do
to the internal model, but not in sets, but in a different topos, in different internal models. And that also gives you another way of getting to higher topos. So you would start with uh, a standard say Gurken League topos, then use this as your ambient category to do the internal construction, and then you also get something that at least looks very much like the higher topos. So there's quite a bit of work in this direction, um, but there, um, there's also quite a bit to be uh, to be worked out. But I think that is a very exciting uh, exciting project to actually um, build the infinity elephant. I mean that's that's the way some people see this. So we we should have a book that's much like the elephant that contains all the semantics of homotopy type theory and all the higher topos theory in one. And that will keep us busy for quite a while, I think. Um, so here what we've done is just to give some evidence that such a theory would actually be useful. So that if we actually have a type theory with good semantical models in toposes and realizability toposes and in growth and toposes, then we can actually do have interesting applications. So that's one of the things I wanted to focus on. So this was the so one of our uses of homotopy type theory was to avoid this exact completion, but because it's basically already the exact completion. The other one is that um, we can now use homotopy type theory as a uh, place to do constructive mathematics, but in a synthetic way. Um, then there's one technical bit I want to highlight because there's um, work around a predictive version of topos theory, and this connects to to that setting. Um, so this is a place where you, so um, what, what type theory gives you, it doesn't give you a sub-object classifier, but it gives you a large sub-object classifier. So the sub-object classifier will live one universe higher. Remember the hierarchy of universes that we saw in the last talk? So if you now want to classify all the monomorphisms into, a, um, into an object, you would map into the universe and this means that the subobject, uh, the subobject classifier, would be some part of the universe and would actually live one universe higher. So this this is a way where we actually have a very nice treatment of predicative toposes because we're doing it in a universe polymorphic way where we actually have the subobject classifier just lives in a uh, in a higher universe. And this um, <coughs> together with support that's now standard improvement systems. This actually looks very much like you're working impredictively, but in fact what's going on behind the scene is a completely predictive semantics. Um, there's another related observation. There's a very nice blog post by Mike Schumann where he shows that if you take this uh, higher categorical and higher topos approach seriously, then you're naturally led to a predictive approach. I won't elaborate on that, I just want to point out the blog post. So this is not just um, type theories being obnoxious or pedantic. There's a actually a, um, a higher categorical uh, motivation for this. Um, so what we do is we, we build on uh, a library to organize uh, our algebraic structures. And we also build on an experimental induction recursion branch uh, by Mathieu Souzeau. And what this does is uh, it so because we don't have this impredictivity, we don't have a sub-object classifier, we need to allow very long inductions. And this is the, uh, so this actually needs extensions of the theory. Um, what is nice in this way is that uh, what we use here is to look at the partiality monad. What I gave you before was the partiality monad, the um, non-terminating computations was um, a plus one, A plus bottom, but that's in a classical context where you can decide whether the element is actually defined or not defined. If you're doing this in an actual computational content, of course, for most computations, you will not be able to decide whether they terminate or not. So you want to have, want to add the bottom element to every type, but you don't want it in a, to do it in a way where you actually can decide whether um, an element is undefined or not. So what you do here is to do a free um, omega CPO completion. And this is defined as a higher inductive inductive type. And this is a very um, advanced way of constructing free higher algebras. So what is very nice, there's now a very nice paper by Peter Lumsdain and Mike Schumann, 
where they showed uh, that the higher inductive types, those are the inductive types that people are familiar from from type theory, but the ordinary inductive types only allow you to freely add objects, but the higher inductive types allow you to freely um, generate objects, but also freely generate equations. And this gives you a very nice syntax to do free higher algebra constructions. So, And they have a very nice paper about this working this out. So that's the uh, theory we're using here. And then we look at, we can actually define R sigma in this way. And this gives you the, uh, the sigma that you're, um, you're using in the uh, computability approach. So it's, it's about time to wrap up. I want to give one, uh, one uh, uh, shout out to uh, related work. There's very nice work by uh, these five people that model uh, higher order probabilistic computation with very similar ingredients. So what they do is they take some standard uh, category for probabilistic computations. So you would take measure spaces or uh, polish spaces and you would take the Giri monad on that. And then you do a uh, free construction, uh, a, a tailored Yoneda embedding to get into a place where you actually have, uh, where you actually have a topos. So you get a, uh, uh, you freely add the higher order, uh, higher order functions in this way. Um, a, uh, and what we've carried out here is actually very similar, but we do it in the opposite direction. So what they do is first do standard probability, probabilistic computations and then go high order. What we do is we take basically standard topological spaces, then do so, some sort of Yoneda to get the big topos. So we freely add high order to topological spaces. And then in that setting, we're actually adding uh, probabilistic computation. Um, these approaches are clearly similar in flavor. Um, no one has worked out the precise <coughs> relationship yet, and I think that would be very interesting to know how they actually relate precisely. So this is what I uh, wanted to show you, just to give some flavor of, of a nice application, I think a very nice application of topos theory to practical programming. Some visions of how we're using homotopy type theory to do formalizations and how we actually need um, new models for homotopy type theory to carry, uh, carry out these kind of um, new synthetic uh, constructions, but also to get new computational models. Those are the main points I wanted to make. Thank you.